Good morning, um, church. Um, greetings again to the Western Community Alliance Church. And it's actually Saturday afternoon or e early evening when I began to edit um, the service for um, Sunday, the 21st of June 2020, which would be today, if you're watching it on the same day, when the news came in that um, the restrictions, again, have had to be um, imposed back on us as Victorians because it's a reminder that the pandemic that we are currently in the middle of is not finished um, as there have been more um, cases reported. So as I was preparing um, while editing, I was thinking, God, what are you trying to teach us as a church, as your people during the middle of this? And it got it reminded me, um, as I posted a couple of days ago on Facebook, that what is the one thing that you can be grateful for in the middle of this pandemic? And a lot of varied responses. But for me, what I've learned is uh, what I spoke about a couple of weeks ago from the verse uh, in, uh, in the New Testament, uh, the book of John, chapter 3, verse 30, where it says that, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. And it's a reminder that everything that we do in the middle of this pandemic, how we react, how we support each other, and just how we continue to live our, our lives um, under the restrictions that are now imposed again, um, how, how do we let Jesus grow in our, uh, in our actions, in our attitudes, in our, in our lives? And how do we let our old self continue to, to be trimmed down, to be pruned away by God? And my encouragement to you is, as we continue to, uh, in our lives, ask Jesus to grow, we will make mistakes, um, as I have. But we, I pray that when we, when we make the mistakes, that we realize it and we come to God straight away and ask Him to forgive us. As it says in um, 1 John 1.9, that he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. And at the same time, also the reminder that even though we think that the shops are now so busy, you know, that I went this afternoon with my son to get a few essentials, but the shops were so busy. But it's a reminder that in John 16, 33, that as Jesus said, that in this world we will have trouble. But what do we do? Do we, do we, uh, do we panic by again? Do we stop what we're supposed to be doing? No. We, will, we are supposed to expect this. But at the same time, we should have the peace that Jesus has promised to us through His Holy Spirit. So my prayer is as, as you gather your family around, as you watch today's service, that we will have that peace. That peace that passes all understanding and I encourage you to share uh, this, um, this episode with your friends online um, and pray for our government. Pray that everything will uh, get back to normal, whatever that normal looks like. Um, and at the same time, I pray that as we continue to, to maybe even some, some, some of us are struggling um, with what's going on, that we will pray and that we'll reach out to each other, and that, uh, uh, that if some people feel lonely, uh, that we will reach out to them no matter what their um, circumstances are. So as you continue to watch today's um, WCAG Online, uh, I hope that you join us as we sing praises to our God, and as we continue to pray again for what's going on, and as we listen to the third message in this series on the Alliance Distinctives as Jesus, as our healer. And that's a pretty hot topic right now. We need Jesus to heal our land, to heal those people who are positive with this COVID-19. So sit back, um, get a blanket if it's cold, um, gather your family, and let's praise our God and worship Him this morning.
G'day Western Community Alliance Church. It's nice to be here with you and uh, to be able to share with you something of Dr. Simpson's heart and ministry as regards to the Ministry of Healing. We are part of a movement, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and we believe that Jesus is our Saviour, Sanctifier, Healer and Coming King. And that's what we want to talk about uh, together today. Dr. Simpson, the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, was a Christ-focused preacher and a Christ-focused writer. He found in Christ all spiritual blessings, and he discovered in Christ the source of all spiritual and physical blessings as well. This is reflected in the movement that he founded and in our logo. Simpson maintained an incredibly heavy working load, and the demands of such, writing a missions newspaper, the overall oversight of the mission and the churches, pastoral responsibilities, concern for evangelism, all of this brought Dr. Simpson to the point of almost physical collapse. And in fact, in 1881, his health totally collapsed. A prominent doctor who was a friend of his said to him, frankly, your days are numbered. And after attending some healing services led by Dr. Charles Cullis, who was a doctor from uh, Boston, Simpson was challenged by the testimonies of healings at these healing services. And Simpson was driven to his Bible to check with himself whether these scriptures were in fact being reflected correctly. He experienced the wonderful healing of the grace of God in his life. A.W. Tozer in his book on Simpson says he was unable to do from that time forward a workload so enormous it staggered belief. Simpson himself would say this, divine healing rightly understood is just the life of Jesus Christ in mortal flesh and a foretaste of the resurrection. It is the work of the spirit to give life to our mortal bodies and, sus and sustaining for ministry. The teaching of healing has always been controversial though. The reason is that there has been so much misunderstanding, there's even been uh, some abuse, and there's even been some charlatans around. There have been many, phonies for example. They even make movies about this. Some of you may know the famous movie by Steve Martin called Leap of Faith, making light of healing, but also making light of people who believe in divine healing. There have been some terrible things done in the name of God, and this can make us feel uneasy about talking about being a movement that believes in healing. However, we indeed believe and teach and preach that Jesus is our Saviour, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King. Simpson himself, though, was vilified and ridiculed as just another miracle, a quack miracle worker. Tozer again noted Simpson soon learned that embracing divine healing, he had opened his arms to all of its relatives, uh, good and bad. Only a few years after Simpson experienced with the Lord as his healer, in February 1883, he wrote in the Alliance Mission magazine the following. The subject of healing is in great danger of being paraded and imperiled or even perverted by its friends. It is a very solemn ground and never can be made a professional business or in fact even a public parade. It must not be used to exalt men or preachers, but for the glory of Christ alone, he said. Its mightiest victories will always be silent and even out of sight and its power will keep pace with our humility and our holiness. We solemnly warn the people of God, he said, against the characters and counterfeits of this solemn truth, which they may expect to see on every side. We trust no one will take this power upon themselves because it doesn't come from us, it comes from the Lord. <clears throat> and we hope the wonder-seeking spirit that is sometimes out there among believers, he says, will not be allowed to take the place of practical godliness and humble work towards the salvation of humanity. <clears throat> That's an that is in fact an important balance for us to keep in mind. The Alliance has never exploited this provision of God. It has never been allowed to supersede our desire to continue in evangelism and world missions. Nor has it ever been allowed to supplant the teaching of the deeper walk that we all enjoy in Christ. I think we need to find some correct perspectives and some biblical balance when it comes to this subject of divine healing. First of all, healing is seen throughout the scriptures. Now, I don't have time to go into all of them, but let me just give you a few. 
Exodus 15, 26. God, when he was promising to deliver his people who were in bondage in Egypt, he knew they were going to leave Egypt and would be in the wilderness for a while, and they had none of the medicines of Egypt to care for them anymore. So God says, I am the Lord who heals you. I'm the one who's going to look after you, and I will care for your physical needs. In the New Testament, New Testament is filled with accounts of the healing ministry of Jesus. In Mark 2, we see the healing of the paralytic man. And in this account, we have some insights into how Jesus deals with people's physical needs. <clears throat> he goes to Capernaum. In Mark 2, verse 2, we read this. He preached the word to them. Notice that. He started with the word. He preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, uh, carried by four. And since they could not get to Jesus in the crowd, they made an opening in the roof. And after digging it through, they lowered him down on the floor in front, in front of Jesus. Now, notice this. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take up your mat and go home. He took up his mat, walked out in full view of everyone. This amazed everybody and they noticed this and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Christ is central in this account. Four unnamed men from Capernaum were ministering to the, wanting to minister to their friend and they brought him to Christ. These men, were not, these, men, <clears throat> these men were not just going to any meeting. They were going to bring their friend to the one who could, in fact, heal. This paralytic man submitted to them, taking him to Christ. Christ in the account is the focal point. Christ is the centre and pivotal person in this account. Christ gives meaning to what is happening here. They brought their friend to Jesus and placed him at Jesus' feet. And Jesus' response was, your sins are forgiven. The forgiveness of this man's sin was more in, a more important priority than the healing of his body at that moment. And it is good to know that Jesus can help us sort out our priorities too. Many have gone to heaven with sick bodies, but no one has gone to heaven with a lost soul. Jesus healed him. And he arose, took up his bed, and the crowd was amazed, and they glorified God. We have never seen anything like this. It was a testimony to the healing power, grace that flowed through Christ. The ultimate purpose in our salvation and in our physical health is that Jesus, who is all, might have all praise, all honour, and all glory. This man went, having, went home having two of the greatest needs met, forgiveness of sins and he could glorify God, a healed body and he could glorify God as well. In Christ we have both, the authoritative word of God of forgiveness and the powerful word of the miracle of healing. In the book of John, one of the signs Jesus used as he showed who he was as Messiah was his healing ministry. Not only the sign, not the most important, but it was a sign. Jesus' focus was not healing, it was the cross. But he used this ministry of healing to demonstrate who he was. <clears throat> there are 23 miracles of healing in the Gospels. 20 of them in the book of Acts alone. So if you want to study this subject, read the book of Acts. And we see the demonstration of the sovereignty of the Lord in the way he chose to, the, to vary the manner in which he ministered the healing effects on people. No two healings are exactly alike, you'll notice, in which he ministered that way. No formula, no method, no special words that we have to learn, we have to learn and perform. We need to let him work according to his sovereignty, according to his wisdom, and according to our need. He healed publicly, he healed privately. He healed individuals, and he healed in front of crowds. He healed instantaneously and he healed progressively. He healed by touching people. He healed when people touched him. He healed by asking people to do something. He healed people without them asking him to do something. 
He healed all that came to him on a number of occasions. But in Mark 1, we see he left a certain place before all the people were healed. He healed at close hand. He healed at a distance. He healed by using means, at one time, some spittle, another time, using some spittle mixed with clay. So you could be part of the, if you wanted to join one of those groups, you could be part of the spittle healing group, or you could be part of the spittle and clay healing group. For me, I'll stick with James 5, which we will come to in a moment. In Acts, the apostles were given gifts for ministry, one of which was the healing miracles gift. 1 Corinthians 12, healing is given as a gift to the church. And James 5, healing is given as a ministry to the church. But secondly, I want us to notice, on what basis can we come to God and ask for healing? Well, the answer is on the basis of the work of Christ. The basis for the provision of healing in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ has two key verses. First of all, Isaiah 53 verse 4 and Matthew 8 verse 17. The provision for physical healing is in the atonement. Matthew 18 17 makes healing a redemptive act by relating Isaiah 53 to Christ's redemptive work. So let's look at that. Isaiah 53, famous chapter, we know it well. It talks about the coming Messiah. Not the coming Messiah in power and glory, however, in this context, but the Messiah who comes as the suffering servant. Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. His punishment that brought us peace the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. Notice verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Now fascinating, the, this word infirmities, the word is often translated sickness. In many places that word is translated sickness. Deuteronomy 7, 1 Kings 17, Psalm 41, Hosea 5. It means sickness. So it's okay to say, surely he took up our sickness. And interestingly, the word uh, sorrows. This word is often translated as our pains or our diseases. So it is quite okay to say, surely he took up our sicknesses and he carried our pain or he carried our diseases. Now in Matthew 8, what's the context of this chapter? The context is healing, a man with leprosy, a centurion's servant, Peter's mother-in-law. Matthew 8, verse 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Now, Matthew is saying here that Jesus is the fulfillment of what Isaiah said hundreds of years before. He would bear in his body our sicknesses and our diseases. There is a linkage made with physical healing in Christ's redemptive work. In that, sickness is a result of the fall. In the atonement of Jesus Christ, there is provision made for our bodies. It's one of the benefits of salvation. And thirdly, I want to look at the availability of this provision. Given that provision is made in the redemptive work of Christ for the healing of our mortal body, does this then mean that all who genuinely seek healing should receive it, just as all who genuinely seek forgiveness of sins will receive forgiveness. Bailey, one of the uh, better known Alliance writers, gave us a caution in his book. He said that just because divine healing was in the atonement, one should not expect immediate healing in every situation. You see, because not all the blessings of the atonement are available in this life, Salvation is more than just a prayer to receive Jesus and forgiveness of sins. Salvation is broader than that. We begin to be conformed more and more in the likeness of Jesus throughout our lives. Sanctification is a part of salvation. Glorification is a part of salvation. Yet, is anybody glorified? Well, the test is simple. All you need to do is get, out, get up out of your chair and walk 
through the wall into the other room and you'll know whether or not you've been glorified yet. So no, we haven't been glorified yet, but it is part of our salvation. How many here have had absolute perfect peace ever since you came to Christ? Have you never worried about anything? Have you had, ever had that complete inner tranquility? Well, the scripture says one day you will indeed have that. So we need to broaden our perspective on salvation so that we can understand what divine healing is about. We don't just push God's buttons and hope we get the formula right and then force him to act. Healing is a provision. It's a benefit given in God's sovereignty. Are we today enjoying all the benefits of our salvation? Well, are you totally holy today? One day you will be. Do you have complete freedom from sin today? One day you will have that. Are we enjoying heaven yet? Well, as good as Western Community Church is, obviously you're not in heaven yet, neither am I. All these things are a part of salvation. We will enjoy all the benefits of salvation when we see him face to face. But until that day, when we receive the fullness of our salvation, we are now receiving what we call the first fruits. We are beginning to experience peace. We are beginning to experience forgiveness. We are beginning to experience freedom from sin. We are beginning to experience being more like Jesus. We are all just beginning. It's the same with the healing of the body. We may experience some of these things as the first fruits of our salvation. Paul says in Romans 8, Even though we have the first fruits of salvation, we still have to struggle because we have imperfect bodies damaged by sin. They're breaking down. Despite your fitness program, despite your diet, they're breaking down, our bodies are. All these efforts we make at one level are in vain because we are still breaking down. Now God may or may not choose to bless you with a healing miracle in this body. It is a wonderful provision and benefit that God has made for us, but it is temporary in this life. You want proof of that? Well, consider Lazarus. He had a pretty dramatic healing. You've been dead for four days. There's no more dramatic healing than that. But Lazarus went through death again. The healing was temporary. It was a first fruit, a taste of what was to come and to show us what salvation ultimately would be. Although healing is temporary, it is still an important first fruit of our salvation in Jesus Christ. How often God has used healing to gain the attention of people, to demonstrate who Jesus was. But we don't command God to heal. I get really uncomfortable when people start yelling and telling what God what to do. Nowhere in Scripture, even in the Old Testament, does it ever say, command thou me, when we're dealing with, uh, when we're approaching God. He tells us to ask. But never does he say, you can demand these things of me. God still heals today. Provision for healing is provided through the death and work of Jesus Christ. It is a benefit of our redemption, received by faith, as taught by James. But notice I said provision has been made. This does not mean that we are immune from all sicknesses and diseases in this life. Now this is not to be misapplied and misunderstood. Paul said to Timothy, for example, have a little wine if you're ill. Now, some people think that means whinge. Have a little whinge when you're ill. Have a little complaint. My wife says that's what men do, apparently. I'll differ with her in another sermon. But Paul says to Timothy, use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your regular sicknesses. Now, is it wrong then for God's people to apply these kind of medicinal ideas for their physical needs? To use the wisdom of true medicine science, is that wrong? Did Luke, who was, after all, a physician, lose his job when he came to faith in Jesus? Do we tell all the doctors, all the doctors in our movement, Sorry, your professional services are no longer needed. Well, of course, there is legitimate need for this. If you don't agree, then you may have to clean out your medicine cabinet in your bathroom this afternoon. God has given us minds that are able to find cures and many things using natural remedies. 
I met a very famous writer on this topic called Richard Sibley, a great book on divine healing, wonderful man. He says this in his book, nowhere does scripture imply that medical treatment is to be refused by seeking God for divine healing. God will not be offended by our taking advantage of every good gift he has provided for the sufferings of mankind. Medical ability and soundness of mind, I believe, are gifts from God, and we should not refuse any of the gifts of God. But fourthly, let's ask the question, why does God allow sickness? Seven reasons why God allows sickness, they're sure. First of all, to discipline us for sin sometimes. James 5 verse 14, the passage is about healing. It says that when we come to the elders for healing and asking for anointing with oil and prayer, verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you might be healed. There is a precondition. We have to deal with our sin first. The implication sometimes is that sin is the reason perhaps why we, why we are sick and God is disciplining us. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is dealing with the abuse of the Lord's table. And Paul says, because you are sinning, verse 30, that is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. Now, it's not talking about our sermon today there. Fallen asleep means it's talking about that they died. And Mark 2, when Jesus healed the paralytic, he, he did not say, he said not get up and walk, but first he said, son, your sins are forgiven, you see. Sickness is related to sin. And sometimes God is disciplining us because of that and trying to get our attention. But secondly also, um, to glorify God. John 9. Jesus is walking along with his disciples and they come upon a blind man. And the disciples operating on the basis that all sickness is related to sin, they say, verse 2 says, His disciples said to him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus' answer goes straight to the point. Jesus says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. See, sometimes people are allowed to get sick simply that God might show his glory in them. In this account, in John 9, the most important issue in this matter of sickness and healing is the glory of God. That's the most important matter, and that's always the bottom line in this matter of healing. But thirdly, also to give us a ministry. Now, not John Mark, Healing Ministries Incorporated of the CMA. That's not what I mean by that. But to give us a ministry of serving and ministering to people. 2 Corinthians verse 1, Paul talks about God using our experiences and comforting us in our experiences so that we will be able to comfort others in the same way that we have been given comfort. That's part of the ministry aspect. Sometimes God allows us to go through particular situations so that we will be better equipped to minister and to help others who might be experiencing something similar. But fourthly, to teach us something that we could not learn in any other way. Second Corinthians, the context is the ministry uh, is the ministry in our weakness. Second Corinthians 12, Paul's thorn in the flesh passage, verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given to me, he says, a thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan to tor torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul calls it a thorn in the flesh that God was allowing to come. Paul prays three times that it might be taken away. And there is something, though, that God wants to show Paul. My grace, Paul, is sufficient for you. God still gave physical strength to the apostle day by day in order that he might glorify God and do the work he'd been called to do. Fifthly, to demonstrate that the sufficiency and power is God's. 2 Corinthians 4. 
we read this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing all power is from God, not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, he says, but not crushed. Perplexed, but we do not despair. Persecuted, but we're not abandoned. Struck down, but we are not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. To demonstrate that the sufficiency and power is of God. Now Paul is not specifically referring to physical sickness uh, there, but the principle applies. One of the reasons God allows us to go through certain experiences is so that we might, in our reliance upon him, demonstrate the sufficiency of Christ. Paul learned and demonstrated that God's grace was indeed sufficient. Sixthly, to prove us. Consider the book of Job. God allows Satan to bring sickness into the life of Job for one reason, to prove the faithfulness of Job. Other things were accomplished as well. We know that. Job learned more about himself. Job learned more about God. But the status, the stated purpose was to prove Job. First Peter. Peter is talking about persecution. It shows the same purpose. Verse 7. These have come so that your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined in fire, your faith may be proven genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. And lastly, number seven, to take us home. This has been the experience so far of all God's saints, with two exceptions, Enoch and Elijah. So friends, God still heals today. And in coming to God for healing, preparation is important. Discerning what God is wanting to do in our lives is important. The key, of course, is our relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's talk about God's sovereignty, the fifth point. We say, I prayed for healing. Why wasn't I healed? Now, some would say that there was unconfessed sin present. Some would say that in their hearts, one of those who prayed, or in the heart of the person being prayed for, there was a lack of faith. One possible answer. But it is not the only possible answer. Paul's problem was the thorn in his flesh, not a lack of faith. Nor was it his problem when he says to Timothy, let Triophimus, leave Triophimus behind, sick at Miletus. Neither Timothy, who had frequent illnesses, why did he not heal him? Lack of faith was not an issue there. In those situations, Paul did not see healing occur. So we need to introduce a caution. While the confession of any known sin and the exercise of faith are indeed normal and necessary preconditions for the reception of the gift of healing. The denial or postponement of our legitimate request for healing does not necessarily imply that either of those two preconditions has not been met. Because you see, the determining factor is this, the glory of God. The bottom line is the glory of God. God heals in accordance with his purposes. If the miraculous healing will give God the most glory, we may expect that. But if there is another pathway, even if it involves pain and suffering and difficulty and loss, if that will ultimately bring him greater glory, his grace will be sufficient for you. You see, for believers, physical health should be that measure of health by which God can be most glorified through our lives. The length or condition of, life, of your life is not the basis for determining God's will. God has every right to take a missionary, for example, like David Brainerd, who was a missionary to the American, uh, the American indigenous. He died at the age of 28. But his life was touched heaps of people, hundreds of people, through his writings, in his diary. As people read, many gave their lives to Christ and even more came forward for missionary service. God has every right to allow that. That's God's choice to allow that. 
But also God has every right to take a man like Albert Simpson, heal and quicken his body for ongoing service. God is so. Simpson, although he believed divine healing was available to all Christians, he maintained that divine healing, to quote him, ever recognises the will of God and bows to that in profound submission. Bailey again, and Dr. Stowes as well, another famous Alliance writer, put it this way, the benefit of healing is governed by the sovereignty of God. Divine healing was not a panacea for all physical ailments, they note. God's will and purpose always has the priority. So in closing, let's consider James 5. One thing that is God's will when we are sick is called for prayer and anointing. James 5 verse 13. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now the emphasis is the importance of prayer and healing, the humble acknowledging of our need, personal preparation regarding sin, that is confession, and get the church leaders to pray. Everything about this passage is designed to activate faith. We are to call the elders, the church leaders, the plurality of elders is involved. That keeps the human agent in the background. No special one individual can claim that they are the healer because God is the healer. The context is in the local church ministry and particularly when it meets together publicly and if the elders come to your home, the leaders are to pray and to anoint you. So friends, in practice, let's practice what is clearly God's will. Let's pray for each other. The elders would come in faith, not with magic formulas, not with fancy words, but just humbly making their partition to God on our behalf and anointing us with oil as a symbol of the presence of the Spirit. They trust in the provision God has made for us in Christ. You too can do that. I trust as you continue to study these topics, and topics like divine healing, that God will take you on a journey of discovery, of his nature, of who he is, and how he has, how he has indeed made provision for us in this matter of healing. God bless you, everybody. I wish I could be with you, but this is the best we can do today. I look forward to seeing you later in the year.
confessed And when I ran to him he said yes everyone. Today we have another story in our series, Once I Was, But Now I Am. This time, Pastor Tam Tran shares his story about growing up in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. I've never lived through a war close up, so I can only imagine the fears and stresses that people go through. Pastor Tam, please tell us about what things were like in your youth and young adult life and the difference that Jesus has made to you. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Um, this is my, uh, my story. I live uh, uh, my youth and young adult life uh, through the war, during the war time uh, in uh, Vietnam. Uh, and um, through my childhood and uh, a young adult life. Um, uh, I cannot uh, imagine that I can have peace, uh, either external or internal. And for me, uh, at that time, peace is just like a strange, uh, vague uh, uh, dream uh, would never become a reality. Uh, during that time, every young uh, person. Uh, from up to the age of 20, had been trapped into the army, and so was I. And I became an, an officer in um, the South Vietnam Army. During the peak of uh, the war in Vietnam, every day there was uh, roughly more than a thousand young soldiers, both sides died. And the line between life and death is very thin. We don't know uh, the next uh, uh, few minutes we can die uh, all of a sudden. Just like uh, many other young people during that time of the war, I try to numb my pain, try to forget my worry, my fear, by getting drunk every day until the war in Vietnam ended. I was put into a re-education camp. I did not know when I would be uh, released. And the days in the concentration camp getting worse and worse because I was like a prisoner without a sentence. One early morning, I woke up like every morning in the concentration camp. I just tried to uh, pat on the shoulder of the, my friend, uh, a prisoner lying next to me, uh, yeah, intended to wake him up uh, to prepare for the uh, labor day, uh, hard labor. Um, and then I found out that my friend died 
over the night. Those things like that happen uh, quite often. And a feeling of fear and increase day by day because uh, I didn't know what happened to me next. During that time, I thought that I never, never, ever find peace internally and externally. But all that feeling and thinking completely changed when Jesus found me. Amen. And he allowed me to meet him, not just meet my Lord Jesus, but also I made the peace that I never thought that I would have. Now, and from that day onward, I don't have to find peace from any sort externally because the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, lives within me with his peace. And the Lord Jesus has fulfilled his promise uh, written in the Gospel of John, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 27, 27, that he promised to leave us, every believer, peace. And I found that peace. And he promised he never forsake me. And he leave me the peace. And he, 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 he assured us that I should not have any worry or fear because he with us within me. And within all of us, what a wonderful Lord and Savior we have and I have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. And Tam, for that beautiful, heartfelt testimony. Um, once then, as we've heard, Pastor Tam had no peace. And especially in that time of war, and he couldn't even have imagined any peace. But the peace he has now, is evident to everyone. This is Pastor Tam's story. It's very, very beautiful. It's very powerful. What's your story? God bless you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Welcome to this week's uh, WCAG news feed. Uh, as, you may know, as you know, um, we are still meeting mostly online because the restrictions are still in place and we still can't go back to the place we usually rent um, in the meantime as we, um, as we meet in church. So we are, our normal prayer meetings will still be online as the restrictions have not been in place. So please um, look out for the instructions on how to uh, log on to Zoom. Uh, uh, I was meant to do an instructional video on how to download Zoom on your smart devices for the people who struggle, but I encourage you, you can actually Google how to do it yourself. Um, but if you struggle, please reach out to us um, and we can hopefully call you on the phone and um, I'll talk you step by step. Uh, the, the meeting room will be changing this week, um, so please keep an eye out for details of the new prayer meeting. ID that you will need to download um, to your uh, to your um, device to join us for this week. And also, our good friends, um, uh, Pierce, Brother Pierce, and uh, Sister Lou Sanquan Sri, have decided to uh, to invite anyone in Wakak who want to be part of a, the Perspectives course that uh, the Cross Culture Church is running. And the Perspective Perspectives course is basically about mission and how it should be at the forefront of everything we do, which is pretty much what um, we have been trying to uh, to foster in our church and in, within the rest of the Alliance in Australia. So here's a short snippet about what to expect. I grew up in the country and then I moved to the city for work. Now I work for a car company doing exhaust systems. I'm married to Ben and we've got a son, Jad. I love taking him out walking and showing him different things around him. It's really lovely to be able to introduce him to the world. 
Recently we did a course called Perspectives. It's a really good course, it really challenges the way that you see God and his plan for the world. I came to Australia from India about six years ago and I've been here since. Uh, I work as an IT technical manager for a major bank. I visit uh, CFOs, CEOs and finance managers of large companies here. Previously, missions never interested me much, but when I started to look at the way God looks at His world, um, it's got given me a, a whole new level of confidence that even though I am an individual, I can do something for missions. I'd already been on the mission field before I did the Perspectives course. I worked in Cameroon in Africa for two years. It was the, the time in my life when I felt most that this is what God has made me for. I grew up in Malaysia. I'm currently working as a research coordinator in a clinical trial facility. And what I do is test uh, new drugs in healthy volunteers and collect blood samples from them. Where I work, it's a very multicultural working environment and I've been able to um, use what I've learned in perspective on a daily basis. And, and that is to really understand someone's background before even telling them, hey, this is what the Bible says and this is what you should know. After the Perspectives course, I went on a short-term mission trip to Indonesia with Ben. The trip really helped to break down some of the stereotypes I had about people from other countries and other religions. It helped me to realise that we're all created in the image of God. If we're all created in God's image, then there's obviously going to be a point where we can connect on some level. If you're interested in people and interested in relationships and want to be part of what God's already doing, then God's got a place for you. The Perspective course has really indeed opened my eyes um, to the many roles that a Christian can play in terms of accomplishing God's ultimate plan. And right now I'm just really trying to figure out what role He has given me to play. We've actually developed a bit of a passion for supporting people overseas and we've partnered up with some friends who started up a mission over in India. Something that I think is really important is to keep reminding people that as much as local mission is important, global mission is really important as well. Previously it was just me standing on the edge and looking in, but now I'll be diving in and getting more involved in missions. We've got this amazing relationship with God and this knowledge of Him, and we need to share it. It's not ours to keep. Thank you once again for watching uh, this week's edition of the CAC News Feed. Um, we, we do uh, uh, celebrate those who had birthdays, um, and also if you have an anniversary, we celebrate with you as well. And at the same time, if you need anything, uh, if you need prayer, if you need, um, if you have questions about uh, who Jesus is, or if you say, if you, you pray the prayer to accept Jesus into your heart. Reach out to us, please, here at, at the Western Community Alliance Church. Our details should be below. Um, please reach out to us. We would love to talk to you. We'd love to pray for you as well. So we have an email. We have a, a text messaging service as well that you can reach out to us. So thank you for watching this edition of Wakak News Feed. God bless you. And see you next week again for Wakak News Feed Online.
amazing grace how sweet the sound what's So much has changed in our world lately. Wo auch immer du bist, ruf seinen Namen an. Jesus. Don't wait another day.